You are listening to the Real Faith Stories Podcast. Interviews with people who chose to boldly follow their faith. I'm your host, Brian Robinson. Now, let's meet our guests and hear their story. Before we meet our guests today, I want to share an experience with you. In November of 2019, my wife and I drove to the Hyatt Regency Hotel at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. We were going there to see our daughter who was participating in a Friday evening through Sunday morning event called Dance Revolution. When we got to the hotel parking garage, it was totally full. After finally finding a parking space outside the parking garage, we went into the lobby where there were parents and dancers everywhere. After checking in, we were told the hotel was completely sold out for this event. Shortly after we got into our hotel room, my wife left. She came back about 30 minutes later with some beautiful clothing, a sweater, and some jewelry. I said, where'd you get that from? She said, Michelle Brogan's boutique. I thought, wait, what? Michelle is responsible for putting on this sold-out event at multiple venues around the country. She has a dance studio, and she has her own clothing and jewelry line, too? Who is this person? Well, you're about to find out right now. Welcome to the podcast, Michelle. It's great to have you here. I am so excited about this. Yes, likewise. 20 years ago, you and your husband, by faith, made a bold decision. Tell me more about that and how it led to this amazing business of helping dancers from all over the country. Yes. So 20 years ago, you know, that seems like such a long time ago, yet I remember it so vividly. I remember one night we went to the service and it was just this preacher that was just so bold and he um, preached in the morning and he said, there's some people and dreamers in this room that you're asking God for big things, but there's things holding you up of how to get there. And whatever it takes, we want you to come back tonight. We want you to bring a Tupperware uh, full of all the things you think are holding you back. And I thought that was the most ridiculous thing I had ever heard. And we got in the car and my husband's like, we're totally going back tonight and doing that. I was like, we're going to bring a Tupperware and we're going to put our, like, God is bigger than the Tupperware. And he's like, yeah, but it's a faith move, Michelle, that we really need to seek God if we're asking him to do these things in our life. And I think tonight he's got some answers for us. So I, we didn't have kids yet. So I sat by the pool that day and wrote my little things of my fears and and what we thought was holding us back for the dream that we didn't even know existed in our lives. And we put him in that Tupperware. We drove to the church that night and there was about 5,000 people in the service. And I remember walking in and just being really bold with God and like, if it's going to be you, I want our Tupperware to be opened. We had pulled this cool up top of this Tupperware thing and put all these things in there. And we put our name at the top. In the middle of the service, this man who had never met pulled out one Tupperware of all those Tupperwares, laying, you know, all the plastic things laying all over the stage, just covering the stage. And he said, Michelle and Alec Brogan, Brogan, tonight is your night that God's about to release something new in you. And he whipped off this thing and threw all our papers everywhere. And I just (laughs) sat there and bawled my eyes out like, Lord, you you did it. And in that moment, God asked me to give something very significant in my life because I do believe that any big dream starts with, with giving. And I gave some diamond earrings off my ears that night because at that point we just were in this really financial, interesting place. And I put these diamond earrings in a, in an envelope and sent them in the offering uh, bucket that night, wondering what would ever happen to those. But it was, it was more than about the earrings that night. It was about obedience. Mm -hmm. And from that night, you know, I was woken up in the middle of the night that night with, um, a vision that God spoke to my heart about what we're doing now. And it was, it was very significant. I saw into what we're seeing now, 20 years ago, I was seeing the crowds, I was seeing the, the faces and it was so big and it was so massive. And I thought, how could I even be a part of something like this? And all he said was, I need you to give me your yes. And that night when I was up, I was writing in a journal. I still have the vision of Dance Revolution. And it was more than about the vision. Uh, It was my yes. And literally I woke my husband up and I told him about it. And I said, God is asking for a yes from me. And he said, well, then you have a yes from me. Mm. And so that was, I mean, it's, it's not some big, it was a yes. And from that moment, the more I put my ear to his heartbeat, the more he gave me vision We had no finances at that time, literally saved or anything. The more a check would come in the mail, someone would give and put money literally on our doorstep. And it was this crazy faith journey that those small yeses along the way, when I look back 20 years, it just blows my mind what he'll do with that mustard seed faith. And here we stand today, 20 years later, I'm I'm still not seeing, you know, the, the things I see are definitely in line, but there's even more to come. 
So I just keep giving him those yeses along the way to see more lives be saved and set free through the vehicle of dance. So you were in Florida at the time of this decision, right? I was. Tell me about the fears that you wrote down on that paper that you put in that Tupperware bowl. Yeah. You know, the fears were mostly me. It was mostly about how could you use someone like me? I know my past. I know my present. I know the education I have. I know the the fears like I, you know, to even lead people, you know, I, though I was teaching classes and I have a, a more bold personality, I had never led anything. I'd led myself, you know, in, in a way to try and to, to get out of the mess that I had been in. But that was only through the grace of God that he led me and then taught me how to lead myself. But, you know, I knew financially where we were at. I knew um, just even the connections in my life that, you know, I didn't feel like I had. And so those were some of the things I put in there. So let's go back to the call. You feel a draw to start DR, Dance Revolution, and your husband said, I'm in. What were the next steps that you took from ground zero, from starting? What did that look like? (laughs) People have to know that I don't remember half of high school because of just my walk away from the Lord and just the lifestyle I was living. And, you know, I had a 1.4 grade point average. You know, I was just bad news. I was bad news. I didn't apply myself. I just was, you know, a mess. And so here's the Lord telling me to start this, you know, after I had renewed my life and started walking with the Lord. And, you know, you, you end up going to the school of the Holy Spirit in that Mm -hmm. time. And here I am asked to, to start this national ministry. And I see it in hotel ballrooms and I see this traveling and I see leading these people. And I'm thinking, you know, literally the night I wrote in my journal, the next morning after Alec gave me the go, I started calling hotels, not having a clue (laughs) what I was doing. I was so on fire and was just like, God, I'm just going to do it. And I literally started calling hotels. Within two weeks, I would, had reached out to people in New York and Los Angeles. I mean, what were you saying to the people you were calling, Michelle? I have this call. I have this vision. It's a convention. It's going around the nation. I don't know what it really looks like, but God is asking me to gather people that love him and that have had experience in the professional world. Are you with me? Like no one even knew who I was. And who are you calling to ask this? This is when, you know, the internet, like Googling, like Christian dance networks, right? Like mm-hmm. that's, that's a great way to find people. <laughs> so like I was like doing a dating network for, for finding people. And through this one man, Randy Flynn, I want to give him a shout out. He is a pioneer in the Christian arts. Through him came one connection to Cheryl Cutlip, who is a rocket in New York City. Through her came um, another name that it was just this beautiful weaving that God had already set in motion to the rock bed of what started DR, a guy from the Philippines. I mean, it was just all these little things, all these little small yeses of me not wanting to call these people because I knew they were going to be like, who are you? You know, I didn't have some big resume. They, I wasn't a rock head on, you know, in New York City. I wasn't some pioneer. I was some girl that was messed up, crazy testimony with a small yes. And so I just went for it. And we made some huge, I made some huge mistakes along the way. And we you know, booking these hotels, not knowing how many rooms, because I was going off the vision he gave me. The vision he gave me was thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So these hotels are like, how many rooms do you need? I'm like, a thousand. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the first year, you know, we have 35 people show up to our first location because we had to start it during the 9-11 era. You know, we had come out of that. And, you know, our first location was canceled. You know, all this prep for a year, too. That's just such an amazing thing to me is all this prep. We had to cancel it. People didn't want to travel at the time. Things were getting weird because I had started the ministry, you know, the months and months and months before that first launch. But, you know, it was just me going, going after it. Let's pause for a sec. I I want to summarize what I've heard so far. This goes back to the church service. Your bowl gets chosen. Yes. The chosen bowl. The Lord calls you out. You and your husband say, we're, we're going for it. And then you immediately start calling people you know to tell them about this grand vision God's given you for Dance Revolution for thousands of people in these ballrooms gathering. How much time lapsed between that night at the church and you taking your next step? The next step to call people? Mm -hmm. I literally was two days. (laughs) Two days. And then Randy. Yeah, Randy Flynn. So Randy is your first contact. He's my first contact. And then that connects you with a rocket. Yes. <laughs> Continue now. 
you know, and I did meet with some people too in that time frame. I had people that I want, I, I wanted to tell. And what's interesting too, you got to be careful who you tell because mm -hmm. there were some people that were totally for it. And there were some people like Michelle, you have no edge, you have no good education, no great background. Yes, you dance. Yes, you dance. <laughs> you're, like, dance. you're like, yes, I do. I got a 1.4 GPA. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So we started moving forward. I gathered a staff of eight people, I believe I had for that first year. I started having staff meetings. No, you know, the thing was way off in the distance, the first location, but I knew God called me to gather people. My husband and I invested money, flew people in from all over the nation to our house and did our first meeting and said, this is what we want to do. We kept them for three days at our house and fed them and prayed with them and fast. You know, it was just this worship time mm -hmm. that and these people had never met me in their life. And I flew them to my house and said, this is what I, I, I you know, just face to face, we casted vision. You know, mm. I'd called them, but then we decided we need to get with these people. So we started doing staff meetings. We booked the hotels. We'd get printed material. You get a mailing. I mean, it's just like all these things that we just launched forward on. It just started happening. And it wasn't easy. And there was a lot of mistakes along the way, but it just started rolling out and new vision would come right when we need it, right when we needed it. How did you find the dancers to participate at the time? We literally sent out a brochure that we had made. And when I look at it now, it's just so funny what you think is cool. And then 20 years, you look at it and you're just like, wow, people came based on that little brochure right there. But I had this graphic designer, my husband, and we put together a brochure. We, we researched a mailing list and we prayed over it for three days, literally laid hands on the boxes and prayed over them and said, God, would you put the seed in the ground? Whoever it is that's supposed to be at this thing that we see in our head, would you put the seed in the ground? And I remember we shipped out those things and the calls started coming in, the emails. Who are you mailing to? We said, uh, we just put a search on dance ministries and dance studios. Okay. Didn't criteria if they were a Christian or not. We just knew we wanted to be an outreach. And I remember sending out 12,000 of them on the first go around. <laughs> you know, seeing the return on that first year was very small, but it was those small seeds that really planted to even see what we see right now. You have been wash rinse, repeat in terms of outreach to grow this ministry? Yes. Stay the course mm. and you keep your eyes fixed on the prize. And we think that's what's been a recipe for what we've seen and the success of the, the kingdom building in it. So bulldog focus. Pull, yes. Laser <laughs> focus. <laughs> Tell me about some of the challenges you encountered. You've already shared some of the, obviously the face steps you've taken what were some of the challenges that you and your husband had to embrace that were just overwhelming, seemingly insurmountable, that God pushed over for you? I remember selling our, our my favorite home that we had, that we had our two kids in, and, and God just saying, Michelle, it's, this is bigger than your home. And we sold that home. And then a couple more years go by, and he asked us to sell some cars and give away some things. And then we had another situation where we had to sell the house again. But those were the things and the decisions we had to make. And, you know, relationships sometimes, even along the way, that can can seem so painful in the process as you grow of maybe people not seeing the vision the same way or, you know, whatever that takes, we had to let go of a lot of things. And the let go seemed so hard at the time. You know, even moving to Texas, we had to let go of everything. You know, we had a, we had a church. We had our family there. We had our friendships. But the letting go is when those two hands become available for all he needs to put in. And so to me, those challenges were a lot of letting go. So those are just decisions we had to make that were challenging for us as a couple, challenging, leaving everything behind. But I would do it again a hundred times for the, the fruit that you see, not right away, but down the road. Releasing and letting go sounds like a huge, critical piece of the whole process that you are continuing to walk in. Absolutely. So would you counsel somebody listening to this that your ability to fulfill something God has placed on your heart is directly related in some form or fashion, perhaps, to releasing or letting go of something else? You know, I think everybody's journey is different, but I do believe, you know, sometimes you have to let go of the good for the greater. And mm. God is the greater. You know, it wasn't just the physical things. It was the Michelle things. It was the fears. It was the trepidation. It was the pride. So I do believe that is a huge piece in mm -hmm. journeying forward with the dreams that God puts in your heart that are really his dreams that he just puts in you. What's one of the most challenging personal things you had to let go of during this whole process? Wow. 
For me, I think the most challenging thing I had to let go of was, you know, the move was big. That was a big piece for me. And it from Florida to Texas. Yeah, that that was a big time in my life that, you know, and I think we think when God calls us to something, we're going to be super excited about it. And he's going to show us everything from the beginning to the end. And the butterflies are flying around. But that was a very dark time. You know, I had very small children and there was nothing ahead. You know, that's what faith is. I think a lot of us want to move. I hear that a lot with what I do and my interns and everything is they're waiting for God to show them the next step before they release where they are. And I'm like, God doesn't work like that all the time. You know, that's what faith is. Faith is, can you take this move? Can you make this move without seeing right in front of you? You know what I'm saying? That blind faith. And so the move for me, and there's been so many things that have been difficult, even like I said, the releasing of Michelle, the releasing of the fear and having to do things um, afraid and having to do things that were very uncomfortable for me. But the move I remember, there was no bright picture ahead that painted the Brogan's in the fashion of this is what you're going to get when you move here. It was just, will you do this for me? And the journey to it and the journey after it was very difficult. Even when we got there, I thought this is going to be it. When we get there, the marching band's going to be ready. The angels will be flapping around (laughs) and it was dark. And, you know, it was just plain obedience. That was just it for me. I think is one of, uh, one of the most difficult times. Describe those first six months after you moved to Texas. (laughs) I remember one time vividly as sitting in a corner of the porch we're at very much, um, those cries that turn in travailing, you know, Mm. and calling one of my best friends and saying, I don't know if he's meeting us here. You know, it's like, I think too, when you're in it, I believe in testing and teachers give tests and when teachers give tests, they're not vocal. They, they let you take it and they're silent so they can see if you know the answers. Right. Mm. And so I think when we moved, it felt like the silence had happened where I thought there was going to be this total revelation and all this. And so in the silence of the test, I had to learn about the weight. I had to learn about the dark room. And I talk about the dark room on our tour as, you know, when you take pictures and you take them to be um, developed to see what the picture truly looks like it's in a dark room that that gets developed. You know, I've heard that, that sermon before by many people. And I feel like that six months in the dark room, I didn't understand that's where I was. I didn't understand the developing that was happening. And that if I came out too early, I was going to be exposed in a way that I wouldn't have been able to handle the incredible things God had for us in Texas. These, this, this massive picture he had. And so I need, I wish I would have understood earlier that the dark room was the process. The dark room was me going from one thing to another and him putting that picture up and saying, Michelle, watch what I'm doing. Just watch. Let me develop you in this. But it was dark for me at the time because I was learning and I was wanting the teacher to give me all the answers. And he was just watching saying, you know them, I'm going to walk you through them. But it was pretty silent in that time. So during the same period of time, how was your husband responding to this scenario? Alec Brogan is the most consistent, (laughs) faith-filled rock. And that's why I believe God has us together because I'm a mover and he's a contemplator. I'm a mover (laughs) at 96%. His mover is, I think, at 20. And so he's the contemplator. He's the thinker. He's the one that lets things marinate and soak and it relishes that. So he was very consistent. He was very much a listener. He gave me what I needed in that season. And he would just look me in the eye and say, we know this was God. We heard his voice. Let's watch him do his thing. And he was right. And so he was, he didn't bat an eye. He was so consistent and constant and just hugged when I needed a hug and prayed when I needed to pray. And he knew that part of me that was so passionate to hear and see and develop and get going. And he was great in that time. I understand you have three different business entities. What are they? We, yes, we have the Epicenter, our studio and Dance Revolution. We have Earthshakers, our convention, and we have Ingredients Training Program as well. Okay. Explain the differences between those three, please. So the first one that was birthed was Dance Revolution, the one that we've been talking about that we're going across the nation, and it's more of a convention style. Uh, I like to explain it to people. It's so hard to explain, you know, sometimes everything we do, but it's, you know, basically a youth conference for dancers, three days set up to give them what they need in classes, and we minister to them, and we 
have church on Sunday. And it's just this major event that God uses the vehicle of dance to make his name famous. And so through that was the development of our ingredients, which we would see guys and girls at these conventions that were always coming up to me going, what should I do about college? I know, I think I want to go to college, but I want to be evangelist, but I want to use my gift of dance. And I'm like, man, there's nothing out there that really gives them all three wrapped into one. It's this discipleship for nine months and it's nine to one every day. And it's these amazing, incredible college age kids that come and they get developed as a dancer, but mostly they get developed as a number one, knowing their identity in Christ, how to evangelize through the gift of the arts, how to evangelize with their voices and learn to publicly speak. And they read through the Bible in nine months. They travel with our ministry. They do hands-on training with that. So that got developed in Florida and I auditioned and put that fleece out. When I moved to, to Texas, three months later, 12 girls moved out here, 12. I thought that was such an inter- interesting number for my first season of, uh, season of Ingredients, which was 14 years ago. And that ministry has been such an incredible force to see these guys and girls get developed. And they're really the rock bed of what we do and travel with us and they perform with us. And then through that came the epicenter. You know, this is seven years old as a studio that the Lord spoke to my heart to develop in South Lake, Texas. And you know, all these people wanted to be a part of what we do, but these young kids couldn't because they couldn't travel the country with us and they weren't old enough to be in our discipleship. So I thought, you know, the Lord just gave me this vision. Why aren't, let's do this in the community. So we started a studio mm. that ministers to dancers and actors and musicians. And we start them off young, little worshipers in there at three years old. And it goes to about 18 years old in there. And uh, we have over 400 students right now. We've only been doing it a short amount of time. And and then came the, the competition, which we just saw what was happening in the world of dance. And we wanted to really reach out to more of a secular, broad entity to bring them to the convention because that's where the message of Jesus is preached. So competition we do in a safe environment because we saw that competitions were just really promoting some pretty crazy things as far as lyrics and costuming and movement that we wanted to go out and really be the lighthouse in that arena. Mm-hmm. We've only been doing that ministry for about, um, we're on, I think, our third year of that. And that really has done its job. We have studios that would never step foot into DR and they come to that and they feel the presence of God and the love and they end up coming to our conventions. And it's this beautiful picture that was painted, just a revolving door that all these ministries just work together with the same mission in mind, you know, and the clothing line started just because I saw the moms at all of our events sitting there watching and getting touched. And I thought, I want to make them feel special too. And so the clothing line was developed out of that. And it's just been this great picture God's put together. I love it. What are some of the issues that you tend to deal with and dive into and help your students with in overcoming the challenges of their life? You know, the big thing I see is kids just needing to discover to discover who they really are. That's always to me the challenge. And with that comes things like issues of eating disorders or cutting or um, addictions, things like that always goes back to an identity and a fear and control issue. And so those are the things that we've seen at DR. We are constantly speaking identity and identity comes through so many different things. You know, we name our tour each year to develop identity and who God is first. And through that and understanding the person of God and Jesus, understanding the power of the Holy Spirit, then we can dive into more of who they are, who they've been created to be. And so with the convention is more of a broad spectrum of that. With the internship, yes, we definitely get into deeper levels. And with our students at the epicenter, depending on the age of seeing, it's basically an identity crisis. You know, when you don't understand and you don't believe what God says about you, Mm -hmm. that's when you go and try and find that discovery in other things, whether it be relationships, whether it be food, whether it be um, self-harm. Those are the things that we constantly have to bring back people back to. And dance is such a sidebar of that. You know, God created them to be a worshiper and performing artist, but really it's a heart issue that we always have to go back to. And what I love is he's developed this ministry through things these kids love to do. They love to dance. So it draws them in and gives them the identity once they know that to know how to use that gift. But that's a consistent factor we see is definitely having to discover and rediscover who they are and who God's created them to be. What's next for DR? You know, what an interesting time to ask that question, right? It's like, you're moving and you're going and you're moving and you're going and boom, a season hits that is uncharted, unprecedented. Where I think DR is going is the same exact place as it was before March 2020. And to me, God's given us a vision of 
you know, my mission's always been changing the face of dance. What does that look like? The face of dance does not look like a worldly thing that was given to LA and New York and Hollywood just to do what we need to do to feel better about ourselves or to entertain people. And so what we see is the growth. We see territories being expanded. We see taking our productions on the road. You know, a big dream in my heart is to one day be on Broadway and have a production. You know, I I go to New York once a year and I just walk the streets sometimes either if I'm there with friends or family. And I love Broadway. I love going to see Broadway productions, but I've seen it many times where there is a light shining from the ground of a production that when people walk out, everybody's going to wonder, why are they crying? Why, why, what is, what was wrong with these people? Was it a sad production? No, they met Jesus in that production. They know who they are now. They've been transformed. We see stadium events. We see TV ministry. You know, there's so many things God spoke and the timing is up to him. Our eyes are focused and locked in on, we believe the greatest, greatest harvest. Everything I've been telling my staff, we've, I meet with my staff more than I ever have all my different staffs. And I tell them to get their muscles ready in this time of waiting because the harvest we're about to see, we're going to need the muscles to carry the full (laughs) baskets we're going to be carrying back to him to lay at his feet because the time is now. And whether he uses dance or whether he uses karate or synchronized swimming or uh, whatever he uses of hobbies of people or with authors, like I know you are, now is the time that what we've been praying for is coming. So our ears and our eyes need to be keenly aware to the yeses along the way, because they're going to be bigger. They're going to be grander. And it's not for us to have that platform. It's for him to have the platform. And if we can keep our eyes focused on that and the motivations of our heart pure, I believe all of us are getting ready to see that acceleration happen in all that we do. Share with me what your morning routine looks like. When do you press into the Lord? Is it an all day kind of a breath prayer or do you have focused moments, focused days I'm sure people are wondering what that looks like. Yes. And, you know, my quiet times, as you call them, my relationship, I've, I've really had to try and teach two of my leadership conferences to allow people to feel grace in changes for the season. You know, I used to be a three and a half, four hour morning girl when I had that. I used to be able to sit for three and a half, four hours. That was pre-kids. That was pre, you know, a lot of things. And when that laughing pre kids life is, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I can yeah. just sit at the feet of you with my coffee and my Bible and just all day open a new journal and just finish that one too. And when that season started changing my life, I started feeling very convicted. I started feeling like, how's my ministry going to grow? How are you going to grow me? And a lady came up to me and prophesied to me once. And she said, your quiet times look like Moses. Stop beating yourself up over it. And that was revelation to me. I started really looking at Moses and not looking at like, okay, I'm Moses, but literally like how his relationship with the Lord, you know, it varied at times and it was consistent all the time though, but he'd go up to the mountain or he'd meet him at the burning bush, but he couldn't have known those times unless it was a daily all day encounter. And so for me now, yes, the morning is going to be my best time. The morning is going to be that time. And I've had to learn how to press in different ways, you know, as a creative, and this is speaking to the creatives out there, you have to be careful with your quiet times. If I play a lot of worship music, I have now created and costumed a full production. (laughs) So my time spent with God has turned into a creation. I had to be careful with my journaling that I had to really keep my time knowing this is me and God time. Nobody's going to get part of that. Not me coming up with a new sermon, not me coming up with a new production, not me thinking about how I'm going to encourage my staff today. This is, you know, God is jealous for our time, right? So I had to Mm -hmm. come up with Michelle and Jesus time. And knowing throughout the day that conversation, knowing the time alone in the morning, people would be surprised to know that my five and six o'clock time is a very interesting time before dinner that I call it my think tank. And I haven't been able to do it in the last seven weeks, but I would go, I have a very specific place I go. It's a construction neighborhood. When I sit in my car, I don't turn on music. I don't, I don't, I listen. I don't talk. I listen. I allow God to, I don't present my request to him in that time. I just sit and I listen, and everything is very quiet. I don't have an agenda in that time. I let him control the agenda like we should at all the times. But it is a daily conversation all day, but I do have segmented times where I do want to hear from my staff. I do want to be creative. So I have those segmented out so I don't miss my time with him in that intimate, quiet space that I don't let it go off the rails I don't listen to, and and people might be surprised if Michelle, you don't listen to worship music during that or whatever. No, because I know myself. And so I think we have to know ourselves with God and not compare it to what other people's quiet times look like or their intimacy with God. You know, sometimes I move, you know, people be surprised, you know, you still dance, you know, I'm going to be 46 next week. 
listen, they might look different than it used to, but that's how I connect with him. And so I have a very unique style, I would call it, with, with my relationship with the Lord of a daily constant encounter, but having to definitely segment my time out so that if he does want to speak to me creatively, I know I have that time with him. Some of that time is in the morning. Some of that time is around my four or five o'clock, depending on the day, and then before I go to bed at night. But it is, to me, a daily conversation. It's not shut off when I come out of the closet of a quiet time. And I think those moments of marinating in him is when you have your aha revelations and your alpha waves begin scientifically to do and hear from him. When you sometimes think you've left that closet or that quiet time and didn't hear, it's through those marinating times that when you're actually doing the dishes or driving the car, that all of a sudden he speaks or it actually gets to where we can hear him. I don't know if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah. I think the, the key point here is you actually get to a place you can hear him. Correct. There's so many things grabbing at our bodies and minds to distract us from his voice. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Anything else you want to add here? For example, is there a key idea that you'd love to leave with the listeners here today? There's a time in our life where we look back and we look at the mistakes and we look at the issues and we disqualify ourselves for what God has in store. And not everything is on a platform. Not everything is with a microphone. Not everything is in front of people. You know, I believe it's our small, even preparation, yes, is behind being in the front and being public with what God is doing that really excels us to see the fruit that we need to see. But I would just say to people, there's nothing that will discount you with God. Now it's, you know, I had to have a turnaround time in my life where I said, take my life, take my mind, take my heart, but it, nothing from my past disqualified me from what he did. It only accelerated what he did because I gave it to him. And so he took all that stuff I went through. He took the hard times. He took the testimony. He took the dark times. He took the, the the high times. And he took that with the obedience of when I let him wash me clean, when I let him take everything about me and say, do what you want with it. And, and radically said, yes, not knowing what he was going to do, that the past did not qualify, did not disqualify me. It actually gave me the ammunition I needed. And I always use this example, Back to the Future. Not going to re- recommend, you know, I, I remember watching that movie and thinking it was so great. And then we tried to have our kids watch it one night. We're like, wait a minute, we watched this back in the Same day? Same here. But there's a good, <laughs> right? Yeah. So there's a good principle in that movie, though, I will say, is the the way to make that car go into the future was the trash. I don't know if you remember that about the movie. The way they made the car move into the future is he had to gather trash and put it in this 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 thing and it would make the car move. And that always spiritually was like, wow, God, you took all my trash once I gave it to you and you put it in this car, this vehicle, whether we want to call it dance revolution or ingredients or just whatever. And you moved it into the future once I dedicated that vehicle and that dream and that desire to you. And that would be what I would tell people listening is let him do it. Don't try and hide what that was or discount what that was. Let him take that because that's been the biggest part of what I think people have been touched wherever I go and I'm able to tell my testimony or I'm able to use a production and most of it's all my trash from the past that he took and, and let it paint a beautiful picture for people to watch and see that there's hope and truth in Jesus. Nothing's wasted. Nothing. Well, let's finish up with the opportunity here. I'd like to offer you to pray for the listeners, whatever the Lord puts on your heart. Okay. Absolutely. God, what an incredible time. I, I just love talking about you talking about who you are, talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, talking about how you take everything from our past, even what you see and have prophesied about our future, and you're moving us forward into your kingdom. God, I thank you that today we see your perspective. God, I pray today that we don't just look at what's in front of us, the circumstances or even what today holds, but that we come up higher as your word says that we are seated in heavenly places and we can see it from your vantage point because from your vantage point, everything looks different. So God, I'm praying for whoever's listening that they go up with you, God, today and they look because what you have in the future is beyond what is going on today. What you have 
coming for your kingdom is beyond just what we're stepping into today. So I pray that we have your perspective in all things. God, I pray for people today that think their dreams have died or they're looking at things in front of them that they're about to bury in the ground. God, when Jesus was in that tomb, we knew that three days later, a resurrection happened that changed the world as we know it. So I pray that as they look at that thing that they think maybe is dying or relationship or whatever it is, God, that if they just let you put your hand on it, that there's resurrection power to move forward and accelerate things in a way that they never knew was possible. I pray healing over people's minds today. I pray healing over people's bodies, God. I pray they hear you, they sense you, they understand you, and they give you their yes. Even the first yes, Jesus, to let you be Lord of their life today. We love you, God. We're so grateful and honored. I I thank you for this podcast, God. I thank you that these things are going to go over airways that we never thought were possible to touch people in areas, in places, in villages, wherever you want it to go, God, that we just pray that favor over it. In your holy, precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Michelle, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the show and share this with someone you believe would be encouraged and motivated by these stories. Until next time, I'm Brian Robinson reminding you that the greatest decision you could ever make is to ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Thanks again for listening.